Welcome to the first session in this course on Rome, Republic to Empire. This will be a course of, I think, 10 sessions in which I try to describe and to explain the transformation of Rome between about 120 BC and about 20 BC from an oligarchical republic with strong elements of democracy into what we can describe as a divine right military dictatorship or into an empire. This is one of the most important events in Western history. It is something which happened more than 2,000 years ago and there are many people who now ask, and it is a legitimate question to ask, why do we still pay so much attention to Rome? Why is Rome at pretty near the centre of our understanding of the ancient world? The Romans were not the only ancient people. There were the Egyptians, there were the Babylonians, there were the Jews. There were, of course, the Greeks but it always comes back to Rome. And so what is it that makes Rome so important? Why, for example, has European art for the past 2,000 years been largely concerned with Rome and Roman history? Look, for example, at this picture, Jean-Jacques David, The Oath of the Horatii, this was exhibited in Paris in 1784, and it caused a sensation. The people who went to see it for the first time knew exactly what was going on. They didn't need a long explanation of the story. What has happened is the son of the last king of Rome, a young man called Sextus, has taken a fancy to a married woman called Lucretia, he has tricked his way into her house. He has raped her. And now she is so ashamed of the fact that she's been raped that she's committed suicide. And her kinfolk take up swords against the king and they expel the kings from Rome and begin the Roman Republic. These are events said to have taken place in 509 BC. So these are alleged events because we have no particular reason to suppose that it did happen or that it happened exactly as described in the later histories. Here is an event that took place in 509 BC. David painted it in the early 1780s and he expected, he expected with full reason, that his audience would know at once what was going on. So what is it that is so important about Rome? And here is a set of bullet points in which I try to give some reason why Rome remains so important. And I'll go through these. Its laws and institutions are a main inspiration for Europe and its civilization. An obvious example, when the American colonies revolted against British rule in the 1770s, once they were independent and once they were able to make up a constitution for themselves, one of the senior deliberative bodies in the New Republic was the Senate. An institution recruited in a very different way from the Roman Senate, but still named after the Roman Senate. In many European Republican constitutions, there is room for a Senate, a senior deliberative body, a senior lawmaking body. Nobody thinks it at all strange if it is named after the deliberative assembly of the Roman Republic. If you named a deliberative assembly the Sanhedrin, for example, people would think it rather strange, but nobody thinks it's strange to name such an assembly the Senate. Its language. Its language was used by lawyers, diplomats and general writers until around 1700. I think it's only in the early 18th century 
that international treatises began to be written in French rather than Latin. I think the piece of Rissick in 1697 was the last international treaty to be written in Latin, which is rather recent. Newton's Principia was written in Latin, and of course, Latin has been taught in European schools and in schools inspired by European civilization all the way from Roman times to our own. And speaking for myself, I spend a lot of my time nowadays teaching Greek, but mostly Latin. And I don't teach Latin to British children for the most part. Only a small minority of my young students are British. The great majority of my students of Latin are Chinese, believe it or not. Latin, and to a lesser extent Greek, are becoming increasingly popular in China. I seem to pick up quite a lot of the teaching work as a result of that. And so this is a republic, this is a civilization which is admired and studied not only within Europe and within those countries which are plainly part of European civilization, but also by the very different civilization of the Chinese. Another point that must always be considered is that Rome was the empire in which Christianity emerged and that Rome is now, as it has been for at least 1,500 years, the city of the Pope. And so for these reasons, Rome has haunted without any break since about 200 BC. Rome is the culmination of the ancient world. It is the empire which included nearly all the main peoples of the ancient world, and it is an empire which lasted from, let's say, 200 BC, 250 BC, all the way through in the Western world, until about 450 AD, I won't give precise dates, and which, of course, remained in the Eastern Mediterranean all the way through to 1453. So this is a course about the transformation of the Roman world from a republic into an empire. And before I can make any attempt to explain the course and the reasons for that transformation. It would help if I were to do something to explain how it is that a small central Italian city-state managed to become the mistress of the Mediterranean. We can talk about what happened in the 130s and the 120s BC, we can talk about the political destabilization and the course of civil wars that culminated in the triumph of Octavian at the Battle of Actium, but that would be to try to explain something in a vacuum. In the first instance, we do need to consider how it is that a small and apparently undistinguished city-state in central Italy could have expanded over several centuries until it was able to dominate first the Italian peninsula and then the western Mediterranean and then the eastern Mediterranean and how it was able, generation after generation, to expand its rule steadily to that point. And then, of course, to say something about the institutional underpinnings that allowed this imperial structure to last for the better part of a thousand years. And so today, what I would like to do is to cover the subjects which are given in this text box on the right of the slide. I want to say something about the legendary foundation of the city by Romulus and Remus in 753 BC, a legendary foundation, I'll emphasize. I've said something about the legendary date for the establishment of the Roman Republic, again very legendary. 
I want to talk about young Skyvilla and his burned hand, about Cincinnatus and the plough, the surrender of Faleri to Camillus. These are all somewhat legendary or somewhat mythical events, but the fact that they might not have happened, or the fact that they might not have happened exactly or even remotely as described in the standard histories, is less important, much less important, than the fact that they were believed and that they continued to inspire emulation by later generations of real Romans. I then want to talk about the Roman conquest and unification of Italy, its series of three wars with Carthage, during which Rome expanded from the hegemonic power in Italy to the hegemonic power in at least the western Mediterranean. And then I want to say something, not very much, because this is a matter I'd like to discuss in a subsequent session, about the Roman intervention in the eastern Mediterranean world, though I will today mention the Roman intervention in Egypt in 168 BC. That blue box roughly describes what I want to talk about. Something I haven't said is that if you have any questions, don't just sit there thinking, I wonder if you'll get to that point. What you must do is to break in and ask a question. If you ask a question, I may give you an immediate answer, or I may say that is something I will discuss in a subsequent session, or I'll be honest about this, you might ask me a question which I am not presently able to answer. You might ask me something about a matter that I haven't so far thought about, in which case I will tell you that I will think about it and give you an answer at the beginning of next week. So don't feel obliged to sit there as if you're watching a television program. It isn't that kind of course. If you have a question, or if you feel that you have a contribution that you'd like to make, please do break in. I will be quiet. I do sometimes stop talking. There's nothing much to be said on this slide, except again to emphasise how Rome has haunted the artistic imagination for many centuries. Bottom right of the slide, a woodcut manuscript illustration from around 1474, do you really need the names given around the edge to know what that drawing is supposed to represent? It is, of course, the assassination of Julius Caesar in the Senate House. And again, do you need any description of any kind to understand what the top right slide is about? This is the most famous murder in history. It happened over 2,000 years ago. And yet, you need no explanation when you see a representation of it. The assassination of Julius Caesar on the 15th of March, 44 BC, in the Senate House, and we all know the names of the main conspirators. We may not perhaps know the exact significance in contemporary terms of the assassination, but it does remain the most famous assassination in history, and that alone justifies an entire course on the fall of the Roman Republic. Here is the empire that I spoke about. It is a vast empire. It runs from Newcastle and Carlisle at its greatest extent down to Babylon and to the Persian Gulf. Those conquests were rather temporary, and so what we can say is that this is an empire that runs from York to the Aswan Dam and from Casablanca to the Crimea. And unlike many of the great empires in history, unlike the empire built by Attila the Hun, indeed, unlike the British Empire, this is an empire which was established and which then continued in being for century after century after century, and the memory of this empire has never faded from those places where it once ruled. The origins of Rome. 
These are shrouded in mystery, unless you want to believe as gospel every fact claimed in the first book of Livy's history of Rome. One of the reasons we know so little about the very early history and particularly the origins of Rome is that in 390 BC there was a sudden and embarrassing attack by the Gauls, people from the north of Italy and beyond the Alps, on Rome. In 390 BC, Rome was a powerful city-state in the centre of Italy. It was the head of a confederation of other cities, most of which spoke Latin or a kind of Latin, and it was not at first glance the kind of power which could be easily overwhelmed by a barbarian attack. However, in 390 BC, the Roman armies were all off fighting a war somewhere else, and there was a sudden and completely unexpected stab south from the Celtic areas, the brown areas in northern Italy, which took the Romans completely by surprise. The Gauls walked into the city, they burned everything, they murdered everyone they could lay their hands on. The Romans held out on the Capitoline Hill until an army could come back and persuade the Gauls to go away. But in the course of this sudden and rather embarrassing attack, all of the Roman records appear to have been burned, or at least a substantial number of those records appear to have been burned. That is the reason why, when the Romans began to write about their history, they did not have the kind of information on which Herodotus could rely when he wrote his early history of Greece. And for that reason, the first few books of Livy are based on various kinds of legend, traditional ballads and songs, contradictory legends. Very seldom are they based on hard historical fact. But if you take the established narrative as truth, Rome was established on the 21st of April, 753 BC, by the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. They were the son of Mars, and on their mother's side, they were descended from Aeneas, a son of Venus himself, and the leader of the Trojan refugees to Italy. There is archaeological evidence for a collection of villages on the hills above a crossing point for the river Tiber, and Rome does have a useful strategic location in central Italy. It is the point where you need to cross the river Tiber. So there is some evidence for Bronze Age villages on the site of Rome, possibly from the 8th century BC, possibly from the 10th. This, I suppose, makes them Iron Age villages, but let's not argue over whether it's iron or bronze that these people used. Rome, like much of the rest of Italy, was settled by various Indo-European peoples. They spoke an Indo-European language that is the common ancestor of Latin and therefore French, Italian, Spanish, etc., of Greek, of all the Germanic languages, of the Slavonic languages, and of many Indian languages. They did share the Italian peninsula, however, with the people whose area is coloured red on the map. These are the Etruscans, a people who spoke a non-Indo-European language, of which we have very limited understanding, but who had a considerable influence on the Romans in the institutional and the cultural sense, and who may also have had a decisive influence on the rather peculiar development of the Latin language. Whether there was an Etruscan conquest of Rome is not something we can say for sure, though it does appear to have happened. Whether there was an uprising of the Romans against their Etruscan overlords is again not something of which we can speak with any certainty. But by around 500 BC, Rome was a 
Republican city-state and the head of a loose confederation of Latin-speaking cities in the western central part of Italy. That's as much as we can say about the very early history of Rome. How is it that this small and otherwise unremarkable Italian city-state could expand, first of all, to dominate the whole of the Italian peninsula, and then to conquer and to dominate the whole of the western and then of the eastern Mediterranean. How is it that Rome expanded in the way that it did for century after century? I said earlier that the truth of a myth is often less important than its effect on people who did undoubtedly live. And Roman history, early Roman history, is filled with stories which may in themselves not be entirely true and which may indeed be complete fabrications, but which did have a large and continuing influence on later generations. And what these myths commemorate and what these myths inspired was a number of peculiar characteristics of the Roman people. And I've listed them here with bullet points. You have extreme patriotism and the ideal of self-sacrifice to the common good. You have a strong religious piety and a strong respect for law and for the ancestral ways of your people. You have a rigid honour in dealings with outsiders. I say that this is a rigid honour. It's an honour which seems more rigid to the Romans who practised this, to, often to the people on whom it was practised. I have no doubt that the conquered peoples often regarded themselves as somewhat tricked. But again, it doesn't matter. The Romans believed that they practised a rigid honour in their dealings with outsiders, and they often did behave more fairly and even more mercifully than other people did to those whom they conquered. This is combined with a ruthless dedication to the military arts. This does not mean that every Roman army was triumphant. It does not mean that the Romans at any one time were the best soldiers in any particular war. The Romans quite often lost battles. On a number of occasions, they came very close to losing rather large and important wars. When I talk about a ruthless dedication to the military arts, I do not simply mean the armour and the weaponry of Roman soldiers, or even the discipline of Roman soldiers, impressive though those things were. I'm talking about an interest in overall strategy, which meant again and again that although the Romans might lose battles, although the Romans might suffer humiliating defeats, they always took a strategic view of the wars they fought, so that even if they faced an enemy who kept winning battles, that enemy would still in the end lose, because the Romans would always think one step ahead, or sometimes two, three, or four steps ahead. And this is something that we see during the Second Punic War, when the Romans found themselves against one of the great military geniuses of history, Hannibal. Although they could not win battles against him, they still beat his country, and they won indeed a complete and overpowering victory over the Carthaginians, even though at almost all times in that war they were militarily inferior. You also have what is strange in the ancient world, a peculiar willingness to absorb other nations and to share citizenship. You add to this a domestic constitutional settlement that ensured civil peace for century after century. You have a Roman constitution which is universally regarded by the Roman people as completely legitimate, which is 
a most unusual circumstance in the ancient world. Although the Greek city-states often give examples of extreme patriotism and self-sacrifice, the Greek city-states notoriously were rather uh, factional places, and it was not unknown, and it was not even particularly condemned if the losing faction in one of the city-states' civil wars <laughs> were simply to go and take sides with an external enemy. Whereas in Rome, that was considered off the agenda. If you lose a political dispute in Rome, you do not take sides with a foreign enemy. You always know for which team you are playing. Let's start then with one of the myths. There is, I keep repeating this phrase, there is no reason to suppose that Gaius Mucius Scaevola ever existed, and there is no reason to suppose that the event portrayed in this illustration on the right ever took place, and there is no reason to suppose that the alleged consequences of this alleged act took place. But I'll say for the third time, the truth of a myth is far less important at times than its consequences. So let's go through the myth as we have it in Book 2 of Livy. In 509 BC, the Romans rise up and they expel their last king, an Etruscan called Tarquin. They declare a republic. Tarquin takes himself off to the surrounding, largely Etruscan, cities which are ruled by kings and says you don't want to let this example stand because if these people are allowed to get away with declaring a republic how long do you think you'll remain kings and so the great over king of the etruscans a man called lars porcela led a confederation down to rome which laid siege to the city and he had overwhelmingly larger forces and it looked as though Rome would be taken and their republican constitution would be brought to a very early end. But a young man, Gaius Mucius Scaevola, a young noble, he volunteers to save the city by assassinating Lars Porcela. Unfortunately the plot goes wrong. Scaevola doesn't know what Lars Porcela looks like when he enters the Etruscan camp, he kills the man wearing the most fancy clothes he can see, who turns out to be the king's secretary, who is paying the salaries of the Etruscan soldiers. Scaevola is taken prisoner, and he's taken before Lars Porcela, who says, you know, you're a very wicked young man, and I'm inclined to throw you headfirst into one of the big sacrificial fires. That can be your punishment for murdering my secretary. Scaevola looks at the king and says, I am Gaius Mucius, a citizen of Rome. I came here as an enemy to kill my enemy, and I am as ready to die as I am to kill. We Romans act bravely, and when adversity strikes, we suffer bravely. He then thrusts his right hand into a fire lit for sacrifice, and... Quite calmly, smiling at the king, he holds it there until the hand is consumed to ashes. Lars Porcelain is so impressed and indeed terrified by this act of self-sacrifice that he immediately lifts the siege and makes peace with Rome. As I said, there is no reason to suppose that this happened. There is no reason to suppose that Gaius Mucius Scaevola ever existed. It doesn't matter. It is a myth which taught to generation after generation of Roman boys, told them of the kind of behaviour that they should emulate. So far as we can tell by looking at archaeological evidence, it does look as if the Etruscans won that war and the Romans surrendered. But again, the truth is far less important than the myth. Let's move to another myth, and this is from deep within the Republican period, 458 BC. The Romans are 
in danger of losing one of their endless wars against their neighbours. Rome itself is in danger. The Roman constitution provides for a dictator in time of emergency. If the Senate decides that there is a public emergency, which can be sorted in no other way, it has the ability to appoint a dictator who will hold total and unaccountable power for six months. The Senate decides to appoint Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus, and my pronunciation of these names veers between the Latin pronunciation and the pronunciation in standard English. You'll have to forgive me for that. But the Senate decides to appoint Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus, an elderly and very unfashionable politician. The only problem is that they can't find him. He's not present in the Senate. He's nowhere to be found in the city. At last, they do find him. They track him down to his own little four-acre farm, quite a long way outside the city, and he is supervising the ploughing. And according to Livy, After mutual salutations, he was requested to put on his toga that he might hear the mandate of the Senate, and they expressed the hope that it might turn out well for him and for the state. Cincinnatus leaves his plough, walks into the city, goes into the forum, conscripts every able-bodied man he encounters. He then marches out and defeats the enemy, and then... After 15 days of dictatorship, absolute and unaccountable power that is supposed to run for six months, he walks into the Senate and says, I've done my job, the enemy's defeated, you don't need a dictator anymore. He resigns all of his powers and goes back to supervising the ploughing of his four-acre farm. Here you have an example of strict obedience to the laws of the state, a dislike of any break in the regular order of government. Although the Romans do have provision for a dictatorship, it is something that is used very sparingly, and those dictators who are chosen do the immediate job in hand, and then, if possible, they resign their absolute and unaccountable power long before the six months' time after which it should elapse. Not an example, I must say, followed in the decay of the Republic, but that is the story taught to generation after generation of Roman boys. And here is another story which, again, probably didn't happen or didn't happen exactly as it is reported. But in 408 BC, there's a Roman army besieging a city called Falerii. It's an Etruscan city. It's on a hill and it has very strong walls. It's impossible to take. But the Romans have surrounded this city and it's rather inconvenient to be besieged by the Romans. A schoolmaster somebody who is employed to teach the sons of the ruling class in Faleri has a bright idea. He gathers up all the sons of the leading citizens and he leads them out of the walls for their morning exercise. The siege obviously is not as close as you might expect, but instead of waiting while they do their running and jumping and wrestling and whatever, he instead leads them straight down into the Roman camp and hands them over to Camillus, the Roman general, saying, here you are, you can use these boys as bargaining chips, you can use them as hostages, you can make that city surrender. There, see, I've done you a big favour, haven't I? And he stands back expecting a big reward. Instead, Camillus is so outraged that he has the schoolmaster stripped naked and bound and he's handed over to the boys, who then whip him back to the city. And Camilla says, We do not fight against boys, but against men, and we will prevail by Roman skill and courage. The leaders of Faleri are so impressed by this singular action 
that they immediately send envoys to Rome to the Senate, offering to surrender with the words, you preferred honour in war to an immediate victory. We now voluntarily acknowledge your victory. It's a fine story, but it is again from before 390, and Livy in the first century BC, when he came to write his history, did not have access to the kind of historical data that we nowadays take for granted, and so something of this sort may have happened, but it may just be a story. But again, it doesn't matter. This is again part of the furniture of an educated Roman's mind, and it is something that the Romans kept in mind, even if they didn't always act as generously as Camillus did. Here, though, is a story from within the historical period. This is a story which is almost certainly true, as described, and which we can take as true in its generality. In 168 BC, when Rome was the hegemonic power in the Western Mediterranean, and when Rome was the main power in the Eastern Mediterranean world, King Antiochus IV, one of the Greek successors of Alexander, one of the most powerful men of his day, invades Egypt. He decided to incorporate the kingdom of the Ptolemies into his own very large empire, which stretched down as far as the Persian Gulf, and he defeats the Egyptian armies, and he lays siege to Alexandria, the capital of Egypt. The kings of Egypt have, for about a century, had excellent relations with the Roman Republic, and having nowhere else to look, the Egyptian government sends to Rome saying, help, please do something. The Romans at the time are fighting yet another war somewhere else. They have no army to send to Egypt, so instead they send an elderly ex-consul, Gaius Popilius Linus. His job is to sail across the Mediterranean with one secretary and a single change of clothes and to take himself off to the triumphant master of the East, King Antiochus IV, and to persuade him to withdraw from Egypt. According to Livy, after crossing the river at Eleusis, about four miles from Alexandria, Antiochus was met by the Roman commissioners, to whom he gave a friendly greeting. Popilius, however, placed in his hand the tablets on which was written the decree of the Senate, and told him first of all to read it. After reading it through, he said, Antiochus said, that he would call his friends into council and consider what he ought to do. Papilius, stern and imperious as ever, drew a circle round the king with his stick he was carrying and said, Before you step out of that circle, give me a reply to lay before the Senate. For a few moments, Antiochus hesitated, astounded at such a peremptory order, and at last replied, I will do what the Senate thinks right. Not till then did Papilius extend his hand to the king as a friend and an ally. And this is where we get the expression, a line in the sand. There is a painting, a French painting, showing Papilius drawing his circle around the king. Now this is an event of undeniable historical accuracy. Whether it happened exactly as described is neither here nor there, but there is no reason to suppose that something like this didn't happen. The Romans were able to send one man across the Mediterranean who was able to face down one of the greatest kings of the day to draw a circle around him and to say, before you step out of this circle, I want an answer to the Senate's demand. And this man was so wary of the Roman name that even though he was the head of a triumphant and all-conquering army, he still had to make the humiliating decision to lift his siege of Alexandria 
and to evacuate Egypt. That is the kind of people the Romans were. That is the kind of people the Romans believed that their ancestors had been. Inspired by their ancestors, that is the kind of people the Romans were. And it is not surprising, therefore, that they were able to conquer the whole of the Mediterranean world. This is a slide which gives a graphical representation of the Roman constitution. This is something that I want to speak about at greater length next week, so for the moment I will leave the slide where it is. I won't go through the meaning of those boxes and the lines connecting them. I will send this slide to you, but I will talk about it at some length next week. So do take it as read that the Romans have a flexible constitution which incorporates elements of elective monarchy in two consuls elected every year and a number of other magistrates elected by the people. It has elements of aristocracy in that you have the Senate, a deliberative assembly of the great and good. It also has elements of democracy in the various popular assemblies where the officials were elected and where all laws were proposed and voted upon. It is a constitution which, as I said, ensured civil peace in Rome for many centuries, from perhaps the 6th century down to the end of the 2nd century BC. And although I won't describe the incidentals of this constitution, I will give you the comments on this constitution and of the kind of people who made this constitution work by one of the great historians, Polybius, a Greek. He lived in Rome. He lived in Rome for many years. He knew many of the main players in Roman politics. And he made a long and profound study of Roman civilization and of the Roman constitution. He observed that Rome had an excellent constitution which combined monarchy and aristocracy and democracy in a stable balance, and that this balance was underwritten by a commitment to honesty and fairness by the Roman ruling class. And what Polybius says is this, among the Greeks, members of the government, if they are entrusted with no more than a talent, that is a considerable sum of gold or silver, though they have ten copyists and as many seals and twice as many witnesses, cannot keep their faith. Whereas among the Romans, those who as magistrates and legates are dealing with large sums of money maintain correct conduct just because they have pledged their faith by oath. Whereas elsewhere it is a rare thing to find a man who keeps his hands off public money and whose record is clean in this respect, among the Romans one rarely comes across a man who has been detected in such conduct. The Romans themselves claimed that they were honest and generally straight, and this is something that was observed and noted by the Greeks. I've mentioned the spread of citizenship, which is one of the hidden secrets of Roman success. Although the Greeks and Romans spoke similar languages, although they had similar ways and a similar outlook on the world, there were considerable differences between both peoples. One of these differences was their approach to citizenship. In order to be an Athenian, you needed to be the child of two Athenians, who were themselves the children of Athenians. It was functionally impossible for an outsider to become an Athenian citizen. The Romans took a very different matter. They granted their citizenship very widely, not indiscriminately, very judiciously, but they granted their citizenship very widely. And one of the most notable differences in the approach to citizenship of the Greeks and Romans was in the status of freed slaves. If you were the slave of a Roman citizen and you were granted your freedom, 
something which many classes of slaves could reasonably look forward to obtaining, you immediately became a Roman citizen. You became a liberatus, a freedman. You did not have all the rights of a Roman citizen. You could not stand for political office. You couldn't join the Senate. But your children had none of these limitations. Your children had exactly the same rights and privileges as those Roman citizens who could trace their ancestry back to the time of Romulus and Remus. Whereas if you were the slave of a Greek and you were freed, a comparative rarity among the Greeks, they were somewhat mean in their approach to freeing slaves, all that happened on your gaining of your freedom was that you resumed your last nationality. If you were an Egyptian or a Persian or a Scythian enslaved by Greeks and you were freed, you simply became an Egyptian or a Scythian or a Persian. You did not become a citizen of the city-state in which you might have lived for 30 or 40 years. And here on the right is a very famous picture. It is the arrest of St. Paul in Jerusalem. Remember, St. Paul was arguing in Jerusalem with the Jews, saying, no, the Messiah has come, and he was Jesus Christ. And the Jews are saying, no, he wasn't. You can stop this. And of course, this being Jerusalem, there was a riotous assembly, the Romans intervened, and the Roman intervention involved, right, get their shirts off, I want everyone tied up and flogged. We want no more of this trouble. St. Paul approached the centurion who was giving these orders and said, uh, excuse me, sir, but is it lawful to flog a Roman citizen? And the centurion said, oh, are you a Roman citizen? Oh dear, okay, well, uh, you better put your clothes back on. And he was then taken before Festus, the Roman governor of Syria. And, well, the story goes on and on. But St. Paul, because his family had acquired Roman citizenship about a century before, could not be flogged like other provincials. He had to be sent off to Rome to plead his cause before Caesar himself. Roman citizenship was very widely but very judiciously spread throughout the territories conquered by the Romans, and it continued to be spread until far outside the subject that we're discussing in 212 AD, the Emperor Caracalla signed a decree granting Roman citizenship to every free inhabitant in the empire. And this was simply the logical culmination of a tendency which begins deep inside the early history of Rome. The Romans did not take an exclusionary view of their citizenship. They saw it as a strategic asset which could be used to create a sense of loyalty to Rome among the peoples that the Romans had conquered. Here is a map showing the growth of Roman power in Italy. The very dark red area around Rome, of course, shows the earliest spread of Roman power. The bright red area shows the conquest or the incorporation of all of those districts which spoke Latin. And then the other colour areas show the later spread of Roman power. The rather beigey areas in the south are the Greek-speaking areas, which were the last to be incorporated into Roman hegemony. By about 300 BC, the Romans had established complete control over the whole of the Italian peninsula south of the Rubicon. North of the Rubicon, you have the Celtic areas, the Gaulish areas, although these areas themselves were heavily penetrated by Roman civilization and by the Latin language. But the Romans had managed to unify Italy, or rather, they hadn't unified Italy in the sense that it was unified in the 1860s, where it became 
a single state with its capital in Rome. This was a patchwork of alliances. Sometimes you have direct Roman rule over conquered areas. Sometimes you have alliances, treaties of friendship. But however Roman power was established and there was an extreme diversity of relationships within Italy, but however established, there is no doubt that by about 300 BC, Rome was the dominant power in Italy. Roman power had imposed peace on the whole of Italy and there was a corresponding growth of agriculture and trade and population. And you might say it's only a matter of time before the Romans look outside Italy. And what brings this about is their relationship with Carthage. Let's have a look at this map. This is a map of the Western Mediterranean. Around the year 264, the year in which the first of Rome's war with Carthage began, the red area, obviously, is Roman territory. This is Italy as united and dominated by Rome. The grey areas are the Carthaginian Empire. There is Carthage on the northeastern tip of western North Africa. The Carthaginians were originally from what is now Lebanon. They were Phoenicians. They had left their home in the Middle East, I believe because of Assyrian domination. They had established a trading base in what became Carthage, which has an excellent strategic and commercial location. And the Carthaginians spread their power all along the coast of North Africa. They conquered most of the islands in the western Mediterranean. They conquered a large area in southern Spain, and they were the hegemonic naval power in the western Mediterranean. They closed the western Mediterranean to Greek merchants. If the Carthaginians caught a Greek trading ship in their own waters, they might sink it, or they might take it, they would take the Greek sailors back to Carthage and kill them in various deeply unpleasant ways. They might crucify them, they might flay them alive, they might burn them alive, they might do all sorts of terrible things. The Greeks hated the Carthaginians, and the Greeks who had early settled Sicily were particularly upset that the Carthaginians conquered most and finally nearly all of Sicily, dominating the Greeks. The Greeks did not like the Carthaginians, and this is an important fact in the souring of relations between Rome and Carthage. But going back to the Carthaginians, the two cities had much in common. They were both aristocratic republics, they were both established around the same time. They were both rather expansionist, though in different ways. The Carthaginians were interested in a commercial empire throughout the Western Mediterranean. The Romans were interested in a largely agricultural empire based in Italy. There was no reason for these two city-states to be jealous of each other because they had different ambitions and there were excellent relations between the two states for a long time. We know that there were treaties, or we're told that there were treaties, in 508 BC and in 348 BC. As I said, they enjoyed excellent relations because their interests did not cross each other. The Romans wanted Italy, Carthage wanted the islands and the non-Roman shores of the Western Mediterranean. But as I said, the Greeks were scared of the Carthaginians. The Greeks were very frightened of them. The Greeks hated the Carthaginians. And as soon as the Romans had conquered and incorporated the Greeks of southern Italy, as soon as the Romans came under the cultural influence of the Greeks, 
Then the Greeks began to work on the Romans. Look, they've got the whole of Sicily. You can look across the Straits of Messina and you can see the glittering helmets of Carthaginian soldiers. You mark my words, just as they conquered all the Greeks in the Western Mediterranean, they'll be coming after you next. You need to watch yourselves, those Carthaginians are nasty people. And there is little reason to doubt that the Carthaginians were rather strange peoples. One of their customs, one of their religious customs, was the sacrifice of children on a regular basis. People would take their newborn babies into the temple of Bel Marduk and they would place their babies into the arms of a bronze image of the god. The arms were stretched downwards over a furnace and the babies would roll down the arms and drop into the furnace and the Carthaginians would then dance around the temple to the sound of flutes and drums which drowned out the screams of the burning babies. For a long time in the 20th century this was regarded as Greek or Roman propaganda to demonize the Carthaginians and then a mass of clay jars was discovered filled with the ashes of children. At first people tried to claim oh these are the cremated bodies of children who died in various plagues it's just that all the babies, as soon as the DNA could be extracted, were male. And it's very unlikely that, that only male babies would die in an epidemic. We do have archaeological evidence for these sacrifices. And there is some of the art of the Carthaginians. And perhaps it's a rather old-fashioned thing to say, but you can tell a lot about the nature of a people by looking at the nature of its art. Carthaginian art does, even though obviously influenced by Greece, does look rather scary, doesn't it? So, in 264, largely, I have no doubt, inspired by the Greeks, a war broke out between Rome and Carthage, and this was the greatest war that the ancient world had ever known. It went on for year after year after year, at vast expense on both sides in manpower and financial resources. At first, it looked as though the two sides would not be able to fight each other. The Romans were all powerful on land, the Carthaginians were all powerful on sea. The Romans were able to get an army across the Straits of Messina into Sicily, and of course they conquered Sicily very quickly. But then the Romans decided to take on the Carthaginians at sea. They got together a fleet, and this was defeated with humiliating ease by the Carthaginians. Then the Romans thought about it and decided that they would become a great naval power, and they would do it in their own way. They found a wrecked Carthaginian warship on the shores of Italy. They took it inland and they put it back together, and they practiced it. They practiced using it on one of the big lakes in central Italy, and they reverse-engineered it. They made copies of it. They built their own fleet, which, again, they practiced in the Italian lakes. And they decided that they would improve on Carthaginian ship design, by building what is called a corvus. And there's a representation of it in the top right-hand slide. You have this bridge with a great spike on the end, and this is kept upright, tied to a mast on a Roman ship. Most ancient naval battles involved using a bronze ram at the front of a ship, you sail straight for the middle part of the enemy ship and you smash it to pieces and you sink it. What the Romans did was they decided that they would change naval warfare to suit their own advantages. When they eventually met the Carthaginians in a real sea battle, instead of trying to ram the Carthaginian ships, they sailed alongside them and this corvus was released. 
and it swung down, smash, digging itself deep into the deck of the Carthaginian ship. And then you can see in the bottom right-hand slide the Romans marching across this bridge and taking over the Carthaginian ship. The corvus was not used for very long by the Romans because eventually they became familiar with the ways of sea warfare. But in the early days, this established complete Roman naval domination in the western Mediterranean, a domination that they never lost. During the First Punic War, during the First War with Carthage, which went on for the better part of a quarter of a century, the Romans conquered Sicily from the Carthaginians, and they also drove the Carthaginians from the sea. This was a tremendously expensive war. It led to a deep and continuing diplomatic engagement by both Rome and Carthage with the very wealthy Greek kingdoms of the East. We don't have a diplomatic history of this war, but we do have a rather late story from about the second century AD from a Greek historian who remarks that towards the end of the First Punic War, the Carthaginians approached one of the kings Ptolemy of Egypt, asking for a loan so that they could continue their war. Ptolemy looked at the correlation of forces in the Mediterranean. He didn't want to upset the Carthaginians, but he didn't want to outrage the Romans either. And so his answer was, I am friends with Carthage and with Rome, and as such I am unable to back one side against the other. And this is evidence of two things. The first is that there were diplomatic engagements by both sides with the Greek kingdoms of the East, and that the Greek kings of the East realised that the Romans had at least a very good chance of a complete victory in this war, and therefore that when the Carthaginians came looking for loans, they should be given a polite refusal. There is the outcome of the First Punic War, and although the Carthaginians ran out of money and ran out of resolve and sued for peace, the Romans granted a rather generous peace. The Romans kept their naval mastery. They took and kept Sicily, and a while later they took Corsica and Sardinia, but they contented themselves with extracting a very large indemnity from the Carthaginians, but otherwise leaving them alone. The Carthaginians remained the dominant power in North Africa, and they were soon able to extend their domination of Spain until they'd taken over half of the country. However, because the Carthaginians had been treated with relative leniency by the Romans, they were in a position to come back for more later on, which is exactly what they did. Here is a representation of a famous event in the early life of Hannibal. His father had been sent off to Spain by the Carthaginians to continue the Carthaginian conquest of the peninsula, and he asked his little boy Hannibal, would you like to come with me to Spain? And Hannibal says, oh yes please, I'd very much like to see Spain. So his father takes him into a temple and makes him swear on an altar that he will never, under any circumstances, be friends with the Romans, which is something that Hannibal kept throughout his life. Here is the Carthaginian battle plan for their revenge. This was their strategy. The Romans dominate the seas. They dominate the western Mediterranean. They control Sicily, Sardinia and Corsica. The Romans have noted that Carthage is recovering and is once again a great power in the western Mediterranean. They're rather frightened that the Carthaginians will renew the war. So they station their fleets between Sicily and North Africa. They station large Roman armies in Sicily and again in southern Italy, three layers of defence, so that the Carthaginians will be deterred from renewing the war. Hannibal, 
who has been sent off to Spain to continue the Carthaginian conquest of the peninsula, has a better idea. Instead of attacking Rome by the most obvious route, he leads a large army and a number of elephants across the Pyrenees, along the southern coasts of France, and across the Alps. He crosses the Alps with his army and his elephants in winter. The Senate has been given warning by various Greek allies in southern France, Massilia, for example, that the Carthaginians will attack them from the north. The Romans find this inconceivable and pay no attention to the warnings. Hannibal bursts into Italy in the early spring. The Romans hurry against him, an army, a very large army, Hannibal goes straight through this, like a Stafford Cripps said, like a hot knife through butter, a total and catastrophic defeat of the Roman army. The Romans get another army together, and they throw this against Hannibal, and that is defeated. And then eventually at Cannae, in southeastern Italy, the Romans get together their last large army, and they throw that against Hannibal, and that also is a catastrophic defeat in which both consuls are killed and a few survivors get back to Rome to talk about the scale of the defeat. The Romans are completely without military means in Italy. But here, what I call the Roman devotion to the military arts comes in important. Hannibal was one of the greatest generals in history. You give him a battlefield and give him an army, he would lead that army to victory. But Hannibal had no sense of strategy. After the Battle of Cannae, Rome was completely defenceless. His officers told him, if you march on Rome now, in five days' time you can be feasting on the Capsuline Hill. And Hannibal's answer was, oh, but the soldiers have fought so hard, I need to give them a rest. So he gave his soldiers a rest of 15 days and then marched off to Rome. He found that the Romans had repaired their walls, shut the gates, and the city couldn't be taken. Hannibal discovered two things. First, the piece of land on which he was standing had been sold for auction at a good price inside Rome which was evidence the Romans believed he wouldn't stay outside Rome. Second, the only army that the Romans could put together was being marched through the opposite gate. They were being marched out through a gate on the opposite side of the city down to the port of Ostia to be embarked for a conquest of the Carthaginian territories in Spain. The Romans couldn't beat Hannibal in Italy. They didn't have any generals who were his match. What they decided instead was to conquer Spain, and that would cut off Hannibal's supply lines back to Carthage because the seas were closed to the Carthaginians. Hannibal's supply lines went through France, across the Pyrenees, through Spain, and then across the Straits of Gibraltar to Carthage, the Romans decided to cut those supply lines by conquering Spain. Hannibal continued to rampage through Italy for 11 years, growing weaker and weaker as the Romans tightened their blockade, until eventually the Romans landed an army in North Africa and began to move towards Carthage. The Carthaginian government lost its nerve, recalled Hannibal, who had to be smuggled through the Roman sea lines. Hannibal put together a Carthaginian army, went out to meet the Roman invaders, and lost his only battle against the Romans at a place called Zama, which you can see to the south of Carthage, just north of the box on this map. The Romans, in that terrible war, won a single battle against Hannibal, but the Romans always contrived to make sure that the battle they won was the last one in the war. In 201 BC, the Carthaginians surrendered, and there is the outcome of this war. The Romans were in no mood for dealing leniently with the Carthaginians after the Second War. 
They took all of the Carthaginian territories in Spain. They took the remaining Carthaginian islands in the western Mediterranean. They confined Carthage to a rather small area around Carthage itself. Carthage was not allowed to have any armed forces and it was not allowed to make war without permission of the Roman Republic. The Romans promised that they would defend Carthage against any enemies who might attack it. And that was seen as the end of Carthage as a great power in the western Mediterranean. However, the Carthaginians did make another sort of recovery. Carthage still had an excellent commercial location, and Carthage remained the largest and wealthiest city in the western Mediterranean. The Romans looked with jealous attention at Carthage, wondering, are these people going to try it for a third time? A long argument in Rome, those Romans are arguing, no, we have a treaty with the Carthaginians, they're keeping it, we're bound to it. Those Romans saying, I don't trust them, we must take advantage of their present weakness and finish them off. Eventually, in 149 BC, the Romans did finish off the Carthaginians, but this is something I want to talk about next week. This was a war the Romans fought in breach of a solemn promise they had made to the Carthaginians. Looking back, the Romans later said that nothing had gone well for the Roman Republic after they had broken their solemn oath and turned on Carthage. It doesn't mean that Rome ceased to expand after the destruction of Carthage. Rome did continue to expand. In every decade, there was a further expansion of Roman territory. But nothing went well in Roman politics. Nothing went well with the Roman constitution. Nothing went well with the political culture of the city itself. But that's something I will talk about next week. At the moment, it's enough to say that this is the Western Mediterranean in 218 BC, before the last war with Carthage. You can see that Rome, the blue area, controls Italy and many of the Western islands. Carthage remains a great power in the southwestern Mediterranean. The east is divided among the successor states to the empire of Alexander the Great. The Romans are attracted east in the first instance because the king of Macedon, that purple area centred on Thessalonica. The Macedonians side with the Carthaginians. They provide financial and strategic support to Hannibal in Italy when he can't get any support from Carthage. The Romans remember this, and as soon as the war with Carthage is over, the Romans decide to punish the Macedonians for what they regard as this betrayal. It's rather a long story, but it's enough to say that the Romans intervene in Greece. At first, the Macedonians, whose experience of Rome has not been terribly creditable to the Romans, think nothing of it, until in 197 BC, a large Roman army meets a much larger Macedonian army in central Greece at a place called Kinoscephali, or Dog's Head, and the Romans score one of their complete and overpowering victories. After which, Rome is the dominant power in Greece, and Rome then spreads its influence and its direct power throughout the eastern Mediterranean, not necessarily conquering the Greek kingdoms, uh, but simply reducing them to the status of Roman satellites. And here, by about 130 BC, is a map showing the territory directly ruled from Rome. You can see that Rome, of course, dominates Italy, south of the Alps. Rome dominates all the islands in the western Mediterranean. Rome now controls the former Carthaginian territories in Spain and North Africa. 
Rome also controls Greece, but Rome is the senior partner in a net of alliances that covers Egypt, Syria, and the territory of what is nowadays modern Turkey. Rome is the mistress of the Mediterranean. It does not directly control the Mediterranean world, but either directly or indirectly, it is the dominant power in the Mediterranean world, and there is nothing to stop the Romans from continuing the spread of that red area until it controls the whole of the Mediterranean world directly and a great hinterland extending hundreds of miles north and south and east of the Mediterranean. The only problem that the Romans face from now on is the decay of their own constitution. And as I said, the Romans later dated the decay of their constitution to the somewhat treacherous final attack they made on the Carthaginians. But again, that is something I'll deal with next week. Now, oh dear, I seem to have taken you past the time that we're supposed to finish. So, was that all right? Does that give an overview of where Rome was by about 130 BC? Right. Yes. Okay. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask you to hold questions over to the beginning of next week? And I'll try to keep myself to the published time next week. In the meantime, thank you for having signed up for the course. Thank you for having listened. And I will send these slides as soon as I have all your emails. And I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. So thank you and goodbye.